And I want to welcome everybody. I'm Bronwyn Strong, the Program Director for the Natural History Society of Maryland. Welcome to Must Learn Thursday. Today, we are so lucky to have Dr. Harry Alden with us. And we are going to explore really deep into what makes wood, wood. Uh, we're looking at the microscopic uh, anatomy of, of wood. Uh, and I am going to now turn it over to our presenter. And I'm looking forward to learning from you, Dr. Alden. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Bronwyn. And thank you for inviting me. Let me uh, start my PowerPoint here. Okay, um, my name is Harry Alden. I'm a volunteer at the Alden Identification Service, which I started in 1986. I want to give you a little introduction of my background, <clears throat> pardon me, then look at microscopic wood anatomy, uh, wood identification, charcoal identification, and then the best part is applied wood ID. There's <laughs> I'm 69 years old, so I have a huge background. Uh, in the early 70s, I, was, I worked my way up from Cook's Helper to sous chef in a, in a resort in Lancaster County. I then had the opportunity, thanks to my dad, to attend Millersville University, and I graduated there cum laude in 1981 uh, with a publication in the American Journal of Botany as a sophomore. Uh, because of that and my grades, I got into oh, six of the 11 top schools in botany in the, in the United States, and I chose the top one, which was at the University of California, Davis, right near Sacramento. Uh, I got my master's degree there, had a blast uh, doing field work and, and microscopy. Uh, from there, I started a PhD program in the University of Wisconsin. I was a research assistant and a teaching assistant in botany. Um, I uh, bailed out of that after a year for, a, it's a long story, and uh, got a job at next door at the USDA Center for Wood Anatomy Research as a student helper. And they said, well, you have all the plant anatomy background. It's going to be easy for you to be able to identify wood. And I worked there as a student for about a year. And then they took me on uh, full time for another year. And uh, once my time, they, they could only employ me for 1,040 a, a hours. That, that wore out pretty quickly. But before that, I got a call from Delaware from the Winter Tour Museum and the University of Delaware looking for a wood identification specialist and interviewed there and got the job there. So I worked from 1986 to 1989. And at that point, I thought, well, I only have my master's degree. I really wanted to go further. So I quit there <clears throat> and uh, decided instead of uh, Wisconsin, which was horribly freezing in the winter time, I wanted somewhere nice and warm. So I got a, uh, uh, a uh, PhD in biology slash botany at the Florida State University. And my study site was a remote barrier island off the coast of Apalachicola. Uh, at that point, uh, the person that trained me at, at Forest Products Lab in, at, uh, in Wisconsin had, was resigning. And I got a call from them saying, would you like to come back full time? So for five years I worked there and got further training in uh, temperate woods and in tropical woods, several years working every day with an expert. Uh, at, in 1997, I got a call from one of my ex-students at the, who was at the University of Delaware, Delaware University, and uh, he had gotten a job at the Smithsonian and said, hey, do you want to work at the Smithsonian? And uh, my parents lived in Lancaster County and my wife's parents lived in Rockville. So I was like, you know, how could you say no to the Smithsonian? And I was their microscope attachment for eight years and, and had some of the very coolest research experience I can imagine. 
uh, at 2005, I left the Smithsonian and uh, just kept doing the business of Alden Identification Service. I also taught for uh, seven or eight years at the College of Southern Maryland as an adjunct professor in botany. Right now I'm retired and a volunteer. Millersville University, this is the paper that I did. I actually made those microscope slides. It was a vine uh, like English ivy that has two forms, a juvenile climbing form and then a, uh, a branched form that produces the flowers. At University of California, <clears throat> had a blast. Uh, I did stuff that was even more detailed. The picture on the right is an electron, a transmission electron microscope showing uh, half a dozen cells with the nucleus and different organelles uh, for just a class, one of the classes that I took there. And uh, Davis was special because most of the professors, when you took a class, they were the ones that wrote the book. And some of the courses I took were so advanced that there weren't any books. Uh, it was really cool. Uh, then in University of Wisconsin, before I left there, I got a chance to uh, learn how to do scanning electron micro, micrographs. The uh, picture on the left was a project that these are carrot embryos that were grown in liquid culture. And the thing on the right is a yew leaf. That's the genus Taxus. Uh, had some bug heads and other stuff that was kind of cool. Uh, at that point, I started at Forest Products Lab and the Center for Wood Anatomy Research, and they became famous in the 20s for the uh, Lindbergh kidnapping trial, where the analysis of the uh, ladder used to burglarize the house and take the baby was analyzed by Arthur Kaler here on the right. Uh, the other thing that's very important is this is the largest research wood collection in the world, about 100,000 verified samples collected by scientists and made into microscope slides. So it was a perfect place for me to learn uh, the wood anatomy. When I first started at Millersville, I wanted to be aquatic biologist, but fell in with a guy who was a plant anatomist. And then one thing led to another and you know how that goes. While I was at Forest Products Lab, I published two general technical references on the hardwoods and softwoods in North America. And it's fairly technical stuff, but you can probably find them on the web. Uh, they're great if you're having trouble sleeping. It's mostly technical data on all the different woods. Uh, then I went to Winter Tour Museum, and that's in uh, right near Kennett Square. It's in Delaware in the little knob on the top of uh, uh, the state of Delaware. Uh, the top left picture is the house that uh, that uh, the uh, guy lived in. They also had these beautiful gardens that were perfect. I loved. They had a, a, a arboretum, which was had some really cool trees. The uh, building on the lower right is part of their research area. So I was, uh, when I was there, I did almost 1800 wood samples from very, very expensive furniture. Some of the chairs were probably at that time were worth about a million dollars. This was me there. Uh, I had a nice lab with a wood collection and a very nice scope. It's a polarized light microscope and had a a couple of publications, mostly in Antiques Magazine. Uh, I worked with students there. This was uh, part of, on an archaeological site, which was a shipwreck in Delaware. And uh, they loved it because Winter Tour was super clean and this was super dirty. It was great, great fun. I uh, then went to Florida State University uh, and I did a project on the effects of hurricane winds and fire on the growth and development of the wood of slash pine. And here you can see uh, two fairly large growth rings. And this is where a hurricane came through and knocked out most of the needles. And because that the growth rings, uh, the tree didn't have as much uh, material to produce wood and the growth rings became extremely small. I also taught some classes in uh, the Tate Cell Swamp, which is between Apalachicola and uh, Tallahassee, where Florida State is. And I got to take some really cool pictures of the flora there. A lot of orchids like the one on the lower left. 
Then I went back to Madison in the freezing cold and uh, worked there for five years and uh, had a really good time. And then the Smithsonian called and I, my job was in Suitland, Maryland. The upper right picture is the uh, facility that houses 98% of the stuff that the public never gets to see. Uh, my scope on the left was a lot more expensive. That was about a $30,000 microscope. And it had a video camera and three other cameras and all these little buttons and stuff. But I got a, I learned how to take pictures of things without staining them, just using filters uh, like the, the uh, center on the bottom. That's a piece of wood, but it shows crystals. And you get all the colors from the uh, refraction, or excuse me, the uh, polarization filters. I also got to work on other cool projects. The lower left is a time capsule that was deposited by the HMS Beagle on the southern tip of South America. And the National Geo used our facility because we had an x-ray that could look through lead. And uh, that's part of it. It shows a stack of coins. So I got to play around doing digital image analysis, which was really cool. And I got to teach at a level that was uh, very unusual. Part of, some of these people are college professors, uh, professionals. Some of them now are heads of conservation at places like the Brooklyn Museum. And uh, we taught polarized light microscopy, wood anatomy and identification, and a couple of other uh, subjects. Okay, so introduction, training and experience to be a wood expert. Uh, my major professor at and Florida State was an expert. And when he testified in court, he said, well, yeah, an expert is a, well, an X is a has-been and a spurt is a drip under pressure. And uh, for me, it, for anyone to do this, and, and I'm one of very few, two or three people in North America that do this, you need one to three months of wood anatomy training at 40 hours a week, and one to three years with a wood ID specialist. And I spent two or three years with one temperate specialist and another two or three years with a tropical wood specialist. And that's working every day with them on unknown objects to come in or samples. Then expert status is another five or 10 years of experience and you need a plant anatomy degree. So basic terminology, I, I spent a lot of time with this lecture to keep it as simple, not as simple, but as understandable as possible for people that know nothing about wood. So here's a, a sample on the right is a, a piece of juniperus, Eastern red cedar, and the older darker wood in the center is called heartwood, that lighter ring around the outside is sapwood, and then there's the very thin bark layer. Um, the uh, 3D nature is very important because this is, these are the type of sections that I take to put under the microscope. I need a transverse section, which is called a cross section, and then a radial and a tangential section. And you can see that there's a different view because wood has a very three-dimensional aspect to it. Oops, wrong way. Okay. Just for lumber type stuff, the uh, cross section is called the end grain, the piece in the center. On the left, you have the radial section where you can see the rays in the wood as little patches there. And then the tangential section is pretty common in most tabletops, uh, even if it's a fake wood. And you can see the growth rings because their growth rings are conical. So when you take a flat cut like that, you cut through the cones and they have these little points to them. So again, it's, uh, these are the three planes, the cross section, then you have a radial, and then the tangential is perpendicular to that. And when I get a sample, I have to trim it down to those surfaces. And some of the samples I get are about half as big as a pencil eraser. And I've got to hold it with my hand and take a surgical razor blade and go in and lift 15 micron sections off. And, and a human hair is about 100 microns. So it's uh, it's not so much the eyes as it is the hands. And this is what some of the planes look like. The one on the left is a cross section and that's uh, cherry. The one in the middle is a radial section and those little brick walls are the, is a ray that runs from the center of the tree out to the edge. 
if you cut that perpendicular, you get the tangential where the rays are like your hand if you're looking straight on. Can people see my picture? I'm not sure this is my first time. So a ray looks like that, the segments in your fingers, the radial, and then the tangential looks like the ends of your fingers. And those are the different uh, ray cells that are embedded in there. The long longitudinal fibers are actually technically wood fibers. That's all great until you get to burls. Uh, this was a sample I got from a customer. Luckily, the lower left portion uh, is not all twisted. Burls are sort of like tumors in that they are, uh, the tree is attacked by a fungus or a bacterium or even uh, insects or birds, and it produces a sort of a wound response and makes, and it's really a pain in the butt to do because it's, it's sort of, you, you don't get all that nice organization. Okay, so for samples, I trim the sample down, I expose all the planes, and I cut thin sections, and I put it on a microscope slide with a solution that's 95% ethanol, and the rest is glycerin. I put a cover slip on that, I put it on a hot plate, and it drives off all the bubbles in the, in the sample, because when you look at those on the microscope, the uh, uh, light goes around the bubbles and it becomes black. And then I take a, take a look at them. Uh, this was me at Winter Tour looking at some archaeological wood from a shipwreck, which is fairly easy to do because it's pretty spongy. Um, and you can see I put samples on the slide there. Okay, some basic terminology. Types of trees with wood, there are softwoods and hardwoods. And not all softwoods are soft and not all hardwoods are hard. Uh, softwoods are gymnosperms, uh, mostly conifers, things like pine, spruce, larch, and the cedars. Uh, hardwoods are angiosperms and the dicots. Uh, monocots are things like palm trees, and they don't technically produce wood, but things like oak and basswood. Uh, some of the pines are very hard. The yellow pines that grow around here are called hard pines. And things like basswood or, or uh, Balsa wood is very soft, but it's considered a hard wood. Okay, so for soft wood, the main cells are tracheids, and these, and I'll show some images in a little while. The main, and this is the really dry part. I'm trying to move through it quickly. Uh, the main conducting and supportive cells, you have resin canals like pine resin. Then you have cells that have very thin walls that are called parenchyma, and you have some in the rays and some that go longitudinally up the stem. Hardwoods have all that stuff, plus they have fibers and vessels. Fibers are the main supportive things. It's what makes oak really hard and what makes basswood very soft. Uh, they have vessels, which are the main conducting cells, and the fibers are main supportive. So in softwoods, tracheids sort of had a double, double duty, and the evolution of hardwoods split that out so that you have a, a separation of function with conduction and support. This is to give you an idea. Uh, if you look on the right where it says softwoods and hardwoods, these are the longitudinal cells. And if you go from the right to the center, you can see there's tracheids. And they do OK with holding things up and OK with transporting stuff. Uh, they don't have open ends on them like a pipeline. It's the most primitive part. And then when you get to hardwoods, this diversification of function, you get the long tubular uh, pipeline, which are the vessels. And they do have some tracheids, but then they have fibers, which don't do any conducting, but do all the structural support. And on the left, you have ray cells. Again, the blue ones in the big piece of wood on the top. And these are the things that conduct things from the center out to the uh, a periphery and, and vice versa. And again, this is uh, just a, a way to show all the different types of cells. And notice they have different pits on them, uh, different openings on the left in the center. You can see it's uh, scleriform, which is ladder-like or simple openings. Uh, you've got different shapes of cells. Some of them look like tombstones. Uh, down the lower left, you've got these crystalliferous cells, and they have really cool calcium oxalate crystals in them. Really, really neat stuff. 
and great pictures when you have polarized light, it makes everything like jewelry. So here's polarized light with crystals and different types of wood. Uh, you can see if you bend the light just right, you can get pretty psychedelic. And I learned that I didn't have to make any section. I could make sections, but I didn't have to stain anything. It was very easy to do. And my supervisors just thought it was wonderful. Uh, also, some of the cells will have spirals and you can have uh, coarse or fine spirals like the, uh, the top two or uh, the top right one is a fine spiral in maple. Uh, the two, the red one and the blue one are coarse fibers and that's uh, things like basswood and, and uh, cherry. And on the lower left, there, these irregular ones are called gashes and that's an American black walnut. That's a very important distinguishing feature. Especially if you have antique furniture and you're trying to decide whether it's American or European. And the European one costs thousand dollars, but the American one costs ten thousand dollars. And this this was one of the few ways you can separate species. Okay, uh, these are growth rings again from my PhD study, 1984, 1985, and 86. There, hurricane came through in 87, and it knocked uh, the crap out of the tree. So for softwoods, this is the cross section. You've got a resin canal. And then you on the right, you have a growth ring that has late wood and early wood. So the early wood's made in the spring, at least in the Northern hemisphere, and the late wood is made in the summer. And this is a cross section uh, showing resin canals. It shows the greener bark on the left-hand side, uh, which also has resin. When I cut my sample trees down in Florida, in about 15 minutes, there was an inch of resin on the stump. And this is just a way for when termites come in, they hit one of these things and it just surrounds them and chemically kills them. And again, you have early wood and late wood. This is a pine sample. The two holes are resin canals that, that don't hold up to sectioning. Uh, for hardwoods, this is oak. And this shows uh, several growth rings. The vertical lines in there are very wide rays. So this is ring porous in that the early wood vessels are huge compared to the late wood vessels. And that with the combination of the wide rays that are running vertically tells you that this is an easy ID for oak. Uh, this is elm on the left. The late wood has an undulating pattern. You can see the wavy lines that are going across and then the red oak group on the right, like I mentioned before. Those white hey, Harry, uh, Yes. Harry, somebody has, uh, Michelle wanted to know, is resin the same thing as amber? Uh, you, you mean like frankincense and myrrh type amber? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, amber is it depends on the type of amber. South American amber comes from a leguminous tree, and Baltic amber comes from a conifer. So, and, and most of that is very old. So, yes, it's very similar. It's just that fresh versus fossilized. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, hardwood anatomy, again, this is a very small stem. It's got a pith on the left and then two growth rings. The uh, blue area is the vascular cambium, and it's a bifacial uh, a, uh, meristem that makes wood to the center and bark to the outside. And let's see, here's uh, the differences between red oaks and white oaks. White oaks have leaves that have a rounded tip. Red oaks have leaves that have pointed tips, but the wood is distinct. And uh, the, the main difference is where the arrows are the late wood vessels in, in red oak are large and circular, and the ones in white oak are very small and uh, rectangular or geometric. Also in white oak, you have tyloses. There's a little asterisk on the right-hand side, uh, the green one, and that those things in the uh, center look like bubbles, but they're actually cell walls that are grown into the vessels to block them to keep uh, pests away. And it usually doesn't occur in red oak. That's the basic way to do oaks. Oaks only, you can only do to red oak and white oak group, but I'll get into that later. 
Okay, so you've got an un, unknown material. Now it's we're in the identification part. I try to get through the anatomy because it's like puts people to sleep. Uh, so you need to understand the macro and the microstructure. Uh, the quality of your reference collections and databases is very important. The proper sample size and how you prepare it is really important. And finally, and this is one that some people that try to do what I do fail because of it. The ability to know and admit when you don't know. Because sometimes you just don't know right away. And people tend to jump to, in fact, my supervisor at FPL at the Forest Products Lab, and we were, we, I was practicing with him, him to do tropical woods. And uh, a couple of times I got it right and he, he got it wrong. And he was like, well, they'll never know the difference. <clears throat> so I learned a lot from them from him, but it wasn't to do it that way. Um, let's see, sample prep. Again, we, you got to cut stuff down. So I went through all this. You saw the sample prep stuff. I use a Nikon Alpha Photo, which is a basic student microscope. It costs about $1,000. I don't need anything real expensive. Uh, and then data collection, you look at the types of cells, uh, their dimension in microns. You can measure that on the microscope any cellular details like pittings, uh, spirals, crystals, and how those cells are arranged in the tissues. Uh, we also, for some, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a cancer survivor, so I have to keep my throat uh, moistened. For difficult tropical woods, we use color or fluorescence test, uh, and the subsamples are shaved down and placed in either water or ethanol, and you record what, what bleeds out of the wood and, and then take a look at it in normal life and under long wave fluorescence uh, of the solutions. After you have all that data accumulated, you've got to do something with it. So you can run it through dichotomous keys, sort of like you do a wildflower. Um, you can compare it to databases worldwide. I have my own personal databases. I use one at North Carolina State, and I'll show you that in a little while. Um, then potential candidates are compared to known scientific samples and our reference collection of over 30 years. Okay, so wood fluorescence, long wave UV light, black light. Uh, this is a set of different samples that I had at winter tour. It's pretty low res, you don't need to know. Mahogany is on the left. Uh, things like uh, 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 black locust and uh, some other ones are on the left. There's a couple of my business. I had wood business cards when I was at, at Winter Tour where they could afford. They were actually made out of wood. So this is normal light and you throw the UV on and some of them glow bright yellow or green. Um, the genus Rue sumac does it. Black locust does it, honey locust does it, and a bunch of the legumes. There's a whole set of tropical trees that are legumes. They produce beans. I had a, a physician that was a woodworker and he was just stunned when I mentioned it, that the wood I was giving him as scraps was a legume. Uh, this is three samples somebody sent me uh, for identification. Uh, samples are as big as your leg, uh, but this is under UV light and the one in the center was a good, and that's a feature that you use in identification. You can also shave them down, put them in water and ethanol, and you get that under UV light. So these are all different features. Okay, wood ID resources. Uh, I use the uh, top two for conifers and basic uh, commercial hardwoods that show up in the US. Uh, when I get into tropical woods, and the, the bottom two are hardwoods keys that are put out by uh, uh, in London, in England. And then number three, which is really cool, and I'm trying to figure out how to do this, it's called Inside Wood. And this was developed by Elizabeth Wheeler in North Carolina State University, uh, a, a, a colleague of mine, and it's on the internet. And let me see if I can get out of this. And uh, where's my, there we go. And then, 
Okay, excellent. Okay, so this is inside wood, and it's got a uh, hardwood men uh, menu, a softwood menu, and then a fossil menu also. So you can go into, and this is not a dichotomous key. It's got over two. It's got over two hundred features, so it's very, very, and it's very powerful. Some I've saw, I've seen people use this and not know what they're doing, and uh, get a wrong ID. Uh, but it's you can tell whether it's ring porous. If you can see my cur, can you guys see my cursor? Okay. So it ring porous, semi ring. I'll just do a quick one here. You put that as present. Uh, simple perforation plates, and then looks for pit size. Let's see if we can do perch. Uh, helical thickenings, tangential diameter, but in microns, uh, how thick the fibers are whether there's any crystals, the type of parenchyma. I mean, look at all these different types of parenchyma that you can get, uh, how the rays are, or, or how wide the rays are in the tangential. Uh, and you get down, you get to crystals, uh, different types of crystals, um, geographic distribution, whether it's a tree, a shrub, or a vine. Uh, what the color of the heartwood is, it can be red, yellow, um, what the water and ethanol extracts, whether they're fluorescent or not. Then you come down here and you hit the button. And it's probably got 100,000 different woods. So now you've got uh, 69 possibilities. And here's birch. This is uh, this is ironwood, Carpinus caroliniana. Uh, this is uh, hop hornbeam, Ostrea virginiana, which is around here. And let's see, go to Carpinus. See, there's a little photo, a little camera there. And you go click in there, and these are the microscope slides for that wood from all over the world, collected by. This is Elizabeth Wheeler. Those are Elizabeth Wheeler. Uh, and you can click on those and take a look at the detail. And you can really crank it up, move it around. And this is, uh, oh, this is Allocasurina. It's out in, in uh, uh, Australia. Again, this is this is just incredible. If you get a, once you get an idea of when you sort through it, you can go to that particular one and say, yeah, that's it, or no, it's not. Anyway, very valuable tool, very powerful though. That is very cool. Hey, Harry, what are the uh, minerals that make the um, crystal? Somebody asked. It's mostly calcium oxalate. There's a couple that make calcium carbonate. I've got a thing here that says screen sharing has stopped. Is that okay? And I've lost Just my- Go ahead and screen share again. Okay. There we go. All right. Okay. okay. Here we go. On to the good stuff. Oh, charcoal ID. I, I, I don't spend a lot of time because it's not very colorful and it's, it's, it's a real pain in the butt to do compared to wood. Mainly because of prepping the sample. You usually have little tiny pieces, which are hard to do. They're very fragile or brittle, depending some, some charcoal just falls apart when you touch it. Others, it, you can hit it with a hammer almost. And the surfaces exposed by, are exposed by breaking it by hand. So you can't really cut through it with a razor blade. You also miss features like the weight, the color, or if there's this particular odor to the wood. Here's an idea, red oak and black walnut, charcoal on the left. And that's stuff from Jefferson Patterson from the uh, website that they have. And you can see that it's different. I can tell the difference, but you'd have to be 
really experienced. It's it's like another level of, of trying to figure things out. And here is yellow pine. Um, on the left is the fresh stuff. I'm sorry, on the right is the fresh stuff. On the right, the left is the uh, uh, charcoal. And you can see in the top left one, it's got a several growth rings. The late wood is sort of a silvery color. And then the lower one, if you can imagine those, the two bottom images are ex almost exactly the same, but very tough to do. Okay, now the cool part. This is this is the this is the where the money is. Applied wood and charcoal ID. So we're gonna I'm gonna show you stuff from anthropology, archaeology, botanical research, fine arts conservation, fine arts provenance, or where is it from? And then forensics. I've got stuff from the Lindbergh kidnapping, which I could do a whole talk on. And then uh, a murder case that I participated in, a federal case that was a sawed off shotgun. And then two cases by the wonderful Ted Bundy and one by the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski. And the both the Ted's, it's like, that's a tough name. Okay, uh, here's anthro. This is a section of wood on the right that was used. Um, is a repair material. When the Spanish came through, the uh, Tarahumara in Mexico uh, were converted over to Christianity and they had a lot of statues called Santos. And I did a study at the Smithsonian with Santos from all over the Hispanic world. And the uh, arms and stuff would get broken off on these things and they were replaced with this, this colorin wood or chilicote erythrina fabloformis. Uh, the weird thing about it is the seeds are hallucinogenic. And if you notice the guy on the left, uh, a brujo probably. So not only did they take the Christianity, but they mixed in some of their own cultural uh, beliefs, which was really cool. Here's a wooden Mayan scepter uh, made of Spanish cedar. Uh, it's not from Spain, uh, the genus Cedrella. Uh, this was a project I worked on. Uh, this one was difficult. You can't just take a chunk out of this thing. I had to do microsurgery on it with scalpel so that when they were done, they couldn't find where I took the little sections. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is charcoal. Very few shots. And, and these are SEM pictures. And I don't have an SEM. They cost way too much money. But because I was at the Smithsonian, I got to use it. So this, these were done by a, a friend of mine who was the SEM technician. And these are from Black Locust. It was a post hole pit that they found doing archeology. span And in the base was charcoal where the building probably had burned down and burned these posts down to the soil. Uh, Black Locust is excellent. If you, if you know anything about that in the woods, these trees, when they die, don't disintegrate. They're extremely, um, degradation just doesn't happen. It, it's too strong a wood, and it's got too strong of chemicals in it. So this was uh, some of the features from that. But it, charcoal with SEM is great, but charcoal with a light microscope is sort of like trying to uh, do needlepoint with mittens on. <clears throat> Here's the uh, tabernacle from St. Mary City. It's in a, it's in Baltimore at a Catholic facility. And this is uh, from left to right, Silas Hurry, Tim Rohr Riordan, and Henry Miller from historic St. Mary City. And we went up there one day and I took samples of the wood so that they could reproduce it uh, for the tabernacle. I don't think it's ever happened when that was about 10 years ago. But uh, another thing at St. Mary City, I got a call from Henry and he said, you know, we're, we're putting in a road here and they cut, they went down a couple inches and they found a bunch of logs on the left-hand side, students in uh, the top left when the student is sitting on these logs. And what happened was in the roads, when it got muddy, carriages would go by and the gigantic ruts would go down and eventually the things would be up to the axles. So they had all of these little, uh, uh, what I would call 
scrap pieces from pine trees. On the right, you can see the bark and the, you're just like the part that they wouldn't use at a lumber yard. And they just threw that down on top of everything. So it was kind of cool. The coolest thing about it was the wood anatomy. When you look at the cross section on the left, there's all these little perforations and those are tunneling bacteria that are anaerobic. They were living when it was buried, no oxygen. And the one on the right shows one of the tracheids that has this tunneling bacteria doing a little spiral thing up the, uh, up the cell. The reason it spiraled is they were going along with the cellulose uh, microfibrils, which are spirally arranged in the tracheids. But it's a really cool picture. This is the HMS de Brock shipwreck that sank in 1789 at the mouth of the Delaware River. And this is the what was left of the hull that was brought up by salvage people. And this is the uh, uh, Delaware State Archaeological Group that was working on it and uh, did everything from the ship uh, fabrication, the mast down to shoe pegs in the shoes. The preservation was incredible. Again, I could do an hour and a half just on this shipwreck. All the pistols and, and the block and tackles and, and boots and, and guns, and very cool. Um, botanical research. Uh, before I left the Smithsonian, I got to do uh, my thesis is on the right. I've talked about that three times. On the left is a, a plant, the genus is called Haptanthus. And uh, it was uh, discovered in Central America and samples were taken and they went back to find more the next year and it disappeared. And they thought it was extinct. So they republished a paper on it. Luckily about three years ago, they found another population. Ah, fine arts. The uh, Boston Museum of Fine Arts contacted me and they have a minbar door. It's on the left there. And uh, this is a minbar in a, in a mosque. It's uh, the place where the uh, person uh, goes up and does a service. And it's really a cool thing. It's made of ebony, a uh, type of pine from the Mediterranean, boxwood, and the, the wood called abura. At winter tour, I said, <laughs> I, my, I got my claim to fame when I was first there the first year or two. Uh, these are a pair of uh, objects that were made by Benjamin Frothingham in Boston in the 1760s. And the flat parts are all mahogany, or excuse me, the carved parts are all mahogany. And the flat parts, which are bright red, or at least were at the time, are called horseflesh mahogany. And this was my key to the fact that one of my predecessors didn't know how to identify wood. And I ended up redoing a lot of his stuff. So this was a, a nice antiques article and it made my early claim to fame in the antiques business. Forensics, one of my favorite things. I was trained at Forest Products Lab. Forest Products Lab was the one that did the Lindbergh kidnapping ladder. Again, I could do an hour and a half on that. And Arthur Kaler is up on the top right next to the policeman um, with parts of the ladder. And it was traced back using wood anatomy and wood morphology at, and a few other things to Bruno Hauptmann's uh, attic. And it, the, the nail holes matched and where it was cut matched. And it's, it's a, a great story. I personally got involved in this uh, when I was at Forest Products Lab. A uh, gentleman was. Uh, or somebody was murdered with a sawed off shotgun in Berkeley is a federal case. Um, the person left the gun at the scene. The police eventually had someone that was a suspect. They went and searched his house and they found the butt portion of the gun or a gun in his basement. And they were made out of birch and there's a cross section of birch on the left. And uh, it's difficult, let's see. Can you guys see me in the little window? Okay, when you cut a piece of wood, like your hands are together, when you cut a piece of wood, it comes out like that. So this would be the gun and this would be the butt. And when you try to identify them, you slide it over and they don't match. And what I, what 
my idea was you would take transparencies of these for an overhead, you'd take one of the pictures and you'd flip it 180 degrees, and then in front of the in front of the jury, you would just slide it over. And all of those little vessels like a, are like a fingerprint, and they all would match up. And that was the end of the case. Okay, good old Ted Bundy. I have two connections with Ted Bundy. Uh, this one on, on the left is a uh, cottonwood tree that in 1978, good old Ted carved his name into in Utah. And this was sent to our lab at the Forest Products Lab, the Center for Anatomy Wood, wood Research. And the cool thing about it is it wasn't in the wood, it was in the bark, which is on the lower left. And in cottonwood, the genus Populus, they laid down the bark in growth rings, just like in wood. And we could trace it back and see that it, indeed it was cut in 1978. The other Bundy one was when I went to Florida State, I realized my major professor was the main witness in the murder trial there because he used a, an oak branch to murder one of, the, one of the sorority sisters. And my major professor was the expert in wood identification then. The other last one was Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. And you can see on the left, his bombs, the outside of his bombs were made of wood. And unbeknownst to me, when this was, I was there at the lab when this was happening, my supervisor was doing the ID secretly for the FBI, and it didn't come out until after the case was over. So, and there's a lot of other uh, forensic stuff related to wood. <laughs> okay, uh, general curiosity, answering questions. Some, when I was at Forest Products Lab, anybody in the United States could send in five samples a year for free to have them identified. They don't do that anymore because they don't have enough people there to, to do thousands of samples, but it's a good way to learn for me to learn to do wood IDs. So it was, what wood is that? If you had a stick in your yard, you could send it in. I did sewer roots that were somebody's tree next door had gone into somebody's sewer and ruined it. And you had to prove that it was an elm and it was from their yard. Uh, academic studies like authentication or provenance where it came from, cultural traditions, where was it made and where did it end up and why, uh, conservation or restoration and the replacement of broken or damaged parts. Uh, we even do that for buildings that are being uh, rehabbed and forensic knowledge for crime solving. Then finally, there's monetary gain. And in the 80s, when I first started doing this, if you remember, uh, there, there was million dollar chairs and uh, the, the largest uh, tall case was $12 million. That all crapped out in the, uh, the, <laughs> the recession. But that's, uh, provenance relates to the value. And if you watch Antiques Roadshow, uh, you can see that. So scientific limits, uh, levels of determination, determination to a genus. So for instance, the oaks or the genus Quercus, that's a very easy thing to do. Uh, the next is down to species groups and then the actual species determination, which everybody wants, and then provenance as where, where it's from. So generically, Again, this is easy. I can tell oak from pine, from maple, from spruce very, very quickly. Uh, species groups, things like softwoods, the pines, you can only separate them into white, red, yellow, and a couple of other Western US groups. Um, the main difference in species with trees is the external features, the needles, the cones, the flowers, uh, the leaves. And the wood is just evolutionarily conservative. And there's a spruce larch group in the hardwoods. There's the oaks, white, red, and live oak. Uh, maples, you can only get to hard and soft groups. Hickories, you can do true hickory and pecan hickory. Uh, and elms, you can do hard and soft. So the next level, which is rarely possible, is down to the species. You can do this empirically through anatomy, that is just with the wood itself. 
uh, for instance, the uh, American black walnut, the Persian or English walnut, and the tropical walnuts and butternuts can all be separated down to species. Hey, Harry, quick yeah. question. Um, uh, how do you identify the wood and fine furniture if not all three types of samples or parts of the tree are present in the peaks? You mean by three samples, you mean the three, view, the three views, cross-section, tangential, and radial? I believe that that's the question. Right, yes. that'll be in any sample that's at least as big as a pencil eraser. You can find all three of those? Oh, yes. Okay. But, and it's, it's it, depending on how small the sample is, it's a real challenge. And most of my customers that deal with fine arts don't really want to hack into the furniture too much. So they're, they're pretty stingy. And there's another one. Um, can you date buildings and structures by looking at the wood used for construction? And you, can you tell if any additions were constructed on the original structure or repairs made by using different or older wood, other woods? You could. And as far as old, older stuff, I, people want to know if I can date wood. And it's really not possible through the anatomy. Uh, we do a lot of buildings that are being rehabbed uh, due to for structural reasons. You have, a, have a, a beam or something that's broken. They want to know what the wood is so they can replace it with the same thing that has the same structural property. So that's, and they send big samples like bigger than your thumb. So that's really wonderful. And for the, the Midwest, there's usually only about three types of wood. With furniture and tropical stuff, it can be anything. And if it's a if it's a, uh, a country piece, it can be even a shrub. So the second one is uh, traditionally empirical through microscopic anatomy and specific gravity. Those are the true mahoganies, the genus Swetenia, and I'll show you that in a moment. And then you can do it deductive through geography. For the genus Liriodendron, it's only going to be tulip poplar in the United States or the Chinese tulip tree. So if somebody sends you a piece of Asian furniture, that's what it is. Provenance is extremely difficult. And you know, for antiques people, that's all they want to know. Most groups show cosmopolitan distribution, all of those ones listed. For, for provenance in, in colonial area furniture, which is our, my specialty, uh, there's only a few Eastern North American versus European. For instance, the black walnuts, uh, tupelo or black gum and hickory, sweet gum or tulip poplar, those are all Eastern North American, along with Atlantic white cedar, bald cypress, and Northern white cedar. On the English side, you have the European walnut, which is technically Persian walnut, it came from Iraq. Uh, true cedar, like cedar of Lebanon. Uh, true cypresses, the genus Cupressus, pardon me, and you, the genus Taxus. And I've done furniture made out of all of those. Here's a specific gravity. Now, specific gravity is related to density. And there's three basic species uh, on the map on the left of Switinia. These are mahogany. Uh, the humilis is on the western coast of Mexico, and it's not very big, and it's also in CITES, so that one doesn't really show up. Uh, the other two are macrophylla and mahogany. Mahogany is a Cuban mahogany uh, in, in the Caribbean area and the macrophylla is in Central and South America. And you can do the, the macrophylla and mahogany on the right, that's the specific gravity. And if it's above a certain level, it's definitely the mahogany species. If it's below that, you can't tell the difference, at least from specific gravity. There's another feature that's in mahogany that shows up either way. So it's fairly complicated, but it, it just takes time. Uh, complicating factors, common names. Many woods have numerous common names. Some woods have 20 or excuse me, two or 300 common names. And if you go on the FPL site, you can see they have a common name database and it's just amazing. So every community in South America that has a particular type of mahogany, they have a dozens of names. 
Uh, commercial versus all woods. Uh, that's complicating. You have to decide whether it's a commercial wood or if it's a country piece. It could just be something that grows not very big around, but somebody made a chair out of it. Uh, species introductions. Uh, English walnut does not come from England. It came from Iraq. Uh, there's a bunch of others also. American black walnut was introduced into England in the 1700s as an ornamental uh, in arboretums. Importation of wood, when you get into the 1800s, uh, there's a lot of shipping of wood back and forth between England and Europe, and that really screws up the provenance determination. And the last one, which is the most important, is the accuracy of publications out there. Here's catalogs where woods are determined by microanalysis. Notice the red. GS is Gordon Salter. He was one of my predecessors at Winter Tour, and he was not a wood anatomist, and he was not a person that told the truth very often. So the stuff that he did is all in question. Uh, the other ones are either by me, HAA, or by FPL, that's the Forest Products Lab, and those were done by Donna Christensen, who taught me temperate woods and was a, a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, the uh, last one on the list is uh, the book that I did for Winter Tour. It's on Queen Anne and Chippendale periods, and it was a huge amount of work. Thank you very much. As I, as I mentioned to Bronwyn, wooden charcoal is only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I can give talks on other microscopy of fibers and stuff on anthropology. Uh, I also am a am, amateur photographer and I love taking pictures of flowers, uh, native stuff. Uh, I've got a half decent fossil collection from California and from St. Clair, Pennsylvania which is near where I was born. I was born in the coal regions and uh, uh, there's some great fossils there. One of my favorite places is Longwood Gardens and the other one is Ricketts Glen State Park in, in uh, up near Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. So again, thank you very much. I'm happy to, I don't know, we know what time it is. Oh, we got plenty of time. I can take questions at however you wanna do it. Yeah, Harry, thank you. If you can unshare, we'll come back all together. Okay. How's that? Yeah, wonderful. Does anybody have any questions for Harry? That was amazing. It was like we're going into a completely different world. Um, and how beautiful the, uh, the, the, the images were. Um, and I don't even think I have to watch forensic files tonight. I had my dose of it already uh, <laughs> with you. It was wonderful. Any questions? Um, any, or... answer, any answers? <laughs> <laughs> Just you raise your hand, unmute, and you can ask a question. I don't know whether that's good or not. <laughs> I guess I guess you answered all the questions. They look smarter already, so it's, uh, you did a good job. <laughs> now let me. So who who was the pioneer in in kind of wood identification at this level? Um, that all of this uh, the work subsequent has been building upon. Is there a, like a a founder of? Um, Mostly that my, my awareness, well, there was stuff in England prior to the US, but in the US, it was the Forest Products Lab, which has been around, I think, since 1910. And oh. one, of their, one of their first anatomists was a woman named Eloise Jerry, and she was a phenomenal person. And again, I could do a lecture on her very easily. Oh. Uh, after that, there was a gentleman called B. Francis Kukachka, who taught Regis Miller, who taught me. Mm -hmm. And the, the person that's at Forest Products now in charge is Alex Wiedenhoff, and he's the one that Regis and I trained before I took the job at the Smithsonian. So it's all sort of turned down. The whole thing about learning this is you can't just take a one week course, right. even if it's 40 hours, it's not enough. You've got to sit with someone for years 
day in and day out and learn what comes through and all the little idiosyncratic type things. Now, do you have a protege following in your footsteps? Uh, my wife I, says she's interested, but uh, we haven't gotten to that point yet. She she's owns the business and uh, she does do some. Uh, she's also a cancer survivor, so I've sort of taken over as a volunteer to do the wood IDs. Um, but I'm I'm on uh, my pension and Social Security, so I really don't need the money, and it, it helps her with her retirement too. But my son is not interested. He's a brilliant uh, IT person, graduated from Towson with honors in computer science and uh, cybersecurity. And he's not interested, and that's okay because it, it, it's okay. So definitely, and I've thought of selling the business eventually when I start losing it, um, and train someone. But again, the person would have to move down here and come to the house every time I got samples to sit with me, and I can't imagine anybody doing that. Plus, I would charge them fifty thousand dollars. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And give them all. I've got filing cabinets full of wood samples and and document and two file cabinets full of documentation on more much more detail than I could ever give here. Well, and Adrian is on the line, and he is one of the leaders of our fossil club. So when you said fossil, his ears picked up, and he wants to know are the fossil sites in PA open to collect? Unfortunately, it used to be until 2019. It's in St. Clair, which is just north of Pottsville, Pennsylvania. And it was a public site. Oh, I heard about it in the 70s. And I've been I've been there about six, six or seven times. And and 2019, I went back up to do some some advertising for the company. And I've seen on the web that somebody said it was bought and closed. And I went by and sure enough, it's got a sign saying, do not enter, this is closed and it's guarded by a Cano Corso or whatever that and so, dog and is. You and you mentioned your company, what is your company? Because if it's, anybody has any wood sure, that they need to it's, it's, it's Alden Identification Service. And the, uh, the website is wood-identification.com. You can just you can just oh, I'm sorry, I'm you can just you can you can Google Alden Identification Service or Wood Identification and it'll it'll come up. What is the weirdest thing that you were asked to um, identify? Uh, probably the sewer routes. Um, mm -hmm. The person that trained me, Donna Christensen, the weirdest thing she had, which I absolutely wouldn't do, is stomach contents from a cow. Mm. Uh, oh, the, the other weirdest one, luckily it didn't fan out, but I got, it was a federal case of child abuse and it was, it was a piece, supposedly a piece of wood from a child's rectum. Mm. Luckily what they sent was not wood, so I didn't have to get too involved in that, but that was probably the weirdest. Mm, that is <laughs> All right, I don't know if I'm, <laughs> I should have asked. <laughs> you asked. I asked. You asked. <laughs> it can get pretty weird. I did ask. Are there any other questions on that note uh, for, for Harry? <laughs> About wood. I'm sure there's some others, but I just can't remember them. Yeah. Well, Harry, this has been lovely. Thank you so much for giving us uh, an insider's tour, really, of, of wood. Um, and I know that I'm not going to look at another piece of wood the same way. I think they, that some of those images would make beautiful, like, uh, prints on fabric or cars or something. It would be calendars, amazing. calendars. I'm going to do it. I do. I try to do a wildflower calendar this last year it was sunrises. And uh, I definitely want to do one just on micrographs because I got a I got a thousand and thousands of them. I think I, I would like a nice scarf with like, some there you go. Those, some wood things going on and some fabric. Every, everything I did at the Smithsonian I took with me because it's public domain. Oh yeah, there you go.
So got Great. I hope that we get to work with you and learn from you again um, soon. You are a wealth of information and um, we're here to mine that. And so you've shared with us and we're now going to take that knowledge and share it with others and make everybody else that we know smarter. Great. Thank you very much. And I, I can't wait. I'm very excited. I've already got my fossil lecture. I had to reshoot some of the pictures, but I've already got that ready to go. Okay, wonderful. Everybody, thanks for joining us and stay safe, stay curious, and stay outside. Take care, and everybody. We'll see ya.